Late in January 1975, a 17-year-old girl named Vera Brandes walked out onto the stage of the Cologne Opera House in Germany. It was empty. This huge space was lit only by the dim green glow of the emergency exit signs. But this was the most exciting day of Vera's life. She was the youngest concert promoter in Germany, just somebody who had a real love for jazz and thought there wasn't enough jazz in Cologne and at the age of 17 had decided that she was going to do something about it. And in one of her very first concerts, she had managed to persuade the Cologne Opera House, this huge venue, to host a late night concert of improvised jazz by the American pianist Keith Jarrett. It was a sellout. Later that evening there would be 1400 people in the venue and Jarrett would simply walk out on stage alone, sit down at the concert grand piano and begin to play whatever came into his head, just improvising. No rehearsal, no sheet music, nothing. But the reason that Vera was on stage that afternoon was to introduce Keith to the piano. And that meeting wasn't going very well. Keith looked with suspicion at the piano. He walked around it, he played a few notes, shook his head. His producer came over. The two of them played a couple more chords, they talked. And then the producer came over to Vera and said, if you don't get a new piano, Keith won't play tonight. There'd been a mistake, some kind of mix up at the concert hall and Jarrett had been brought the brand of piano that he wanted, a Bosendorfer piano, um, but they'd brought him the wrong piano. They'd brought him a rehearsal piano. It was beaten up, it was out of tune, the pedals were sticking, the upper registers sounded harsh and tinny and the piano was just too small. There was no way it could even create the volume necessary to fill this enormous space. It was unplayable. And of course, Jarrett naturally decided he didn't want to play it. So he left, leaving Vera to scramble to try to get a replacement. That, it turned out, was impossible. There wasn't enough time, there weren't the people to move a piano around. All she could find was a piano tuner to try to at least get the notes sounding you know, in the right keys. So all she could do at that point was to run after Keith Jarrett. She found him sitting in the car, waiting to be driven back to his hotel. And she knelt down outside the car window. It was raining hard. He wound down the window. She made eye contact with him and she begged him to play. And Jarrett looked out and he saw this rain drenched German teenager. And he thought of what would happen when 1400 people showed up for this concert and there was no music. And he felt sorry for her. He said, never forget, only for you. So later that evening, in front of 1400 people, Keith Jarrett walked out onto the stage. He sat down at this piano that he knew was unplayable and he began. And within moments, it became clear that something magical was happening. Jarrett was avoiding the harsh upper keys of the piano. He was sticking to the middle notes. That gave the music a, a very soothing, ambient quality. But because the piano was so small, he had to, to pound down on it, to stand up and to hit it with real force. He would also set up these rumbling, repetitive riffs in the bass to try to create enough resonance to fill the whole space. So there was this tension between the very peaceful, soothing, calming notes he was playing and the force with which he was playing them. And that tension created a magical performance. The audience loved it and audiences continue to love it because Keith Jarrett's producer 
recorded the concert. Not because he thought it would be a good concert, but because he wanted documentary evidence of what a musical catastrophe sounds like. Well, they didn't get a catastrophe. They got a masterpiece, the Cone Concert. It's the best-selling jazz piano concert in history. And I personally love it. My wife loves it. Two of our children were born while she was listening to Keith Jarrett's Cone Concert. I mean, it is a very special piece of music. Uh, but I didn't come to talk to you about jazz. I came to talk to you about something else, or what that concert symbolizes. What must have gone through Keith Jarrett's mind? Why did he resist? And was it really so surprising in having to cope with the unplayable piano? He in fact created the most successful piece of music that he'd ever made. I don't think it is a coincidence. So let's talk a little bit about the psychology and the creativity behind the unplayable piano. And let's face up to where we are. It's a difficult time, right? I know uh, Uruguay is uh, in the middle of its first wave. Uh, as I speak to you, it's just before Christmas here in the UK. Uh, the government had a plan to uh, allow everyone to just get together, relax the rules a little bit for a few days. And then just uh, two days ago, everything changed. The situation is too bad. Uh, families just cancelled all their plans. Just yet another obstacle, yet another disruption. And we've all, all of us, had to cope with these obstacles and these disruptions. But while the damage is very real, um, the harm is real, people are dying, people are losing their jobs, there is also something very strange and sometimes very positive about these sorts of obstacles, these sorts of problems. And just the fact that I'm talking to you while I'm, I'm sitting here in my study in Oxford, and it's possible to have that conversation without uh, flying halfway around the world, without em emitting all that carbon dioxide contributing to global warming. I'm not sure we would have really thought to do that before the pandemic. So these obstacles force us into a creative response, just as Keith Jarrett was forced into a creative response. So let's think about why. Why, why does that happen? And I think basically there are, there are two reasons. One is simply about the, the psychology of what it means to face an obstacle. So I talked about this with uh, the musician, the composer, Brian Eno. We'll, we'll hear a little bit more about Brian Eno soon. Um, but Brian Eno has worked with, with U2, with Coldplay, with David Bowie, and done amazing work in his own right. And he's thought a great deal about the psychology of creativity. And what he said to me was, you know, the enemy of creative work is boredom, and the friend of creative work is attention, it's alertness. And when we are faced with you see, disruptions everywhere. <laughs> when we are faced with a, a, a difficult situation, a challenge, what it immediately does is to focus our attention. Uh, it's, a, it's a crisis moment. We are completely present. When instead we uh, are doing the same thing every day, going to the same place every day, talking to the same people every day, we're not creative, we get bored. And you might say, well, but nobody wants to be bored. We all want to be creative. But of course we do sort of want to be bored because we do like our routines. We do like familiar places. We do like familiar people. How, you know, how many people go to the same cafe and, and there's, a, there's a particular chair that they prefer if they can get it, that's their chair. Uh, I know I behave like this. So we're constantly fighting against our own need to do things the same every time. So that's one of the things that's going on. It's that, it's that the psychology of boredom versus the psychology of alertness. But there's something else. Uh, and that is simply that when there is an obstacle placed in your way, you have to find a, a different path. 
And sometimes the different path is a better path. Here we are, I couldn't fly to Uruguay, I couldn't be with you in person. Well, suddenly we have a different way to do things. And maybe if we'd thought about it, maybe this would have been the way we would have chosen all along. I'm not sure. Certainly for some people in some cases, things have been possible that were always possible, and yet we never quite imagined doing them. Let me give you a little example of this process of, of the obstacle forces the, you to, to find the solution that was always possible, was always there. So uh, in uh, London, in the UK, uh, we have a big uh, underground system, London Underground, uh, and it gets millions of people to work every morning. About five, six years ago, there was a, a strike, industrial action, that closed down half of the stations on the London Underground. So um, commuters could maybe go to a different station, use a different line, or they could use the overground train or the buses. They had other options, but many people had to change what they did. And the strike lasted only 48 hours. But uh, three economists got hold of the data from the London transport system. And they found that um, tens of thousands of people had changed their routes because of the strike. And then they never changed back. They realized that they had been doing it wrong their whole lives. They could always have had uh, this better route that they'd found, but they only found the better route because of the 48 hours of disruption. So those are these, the two things that are really going on. The, the psychology of paying more attention because the situation is challenging, and then being forced to do something uh, different. Uh, the, the, just the physical structure of the problem has changed, as with the London Underground. I mean, let me give you an example of uh, how this might play out in, um, in a real-world uh, experiment. Very interesting experiment uh, done, uh, conducted by three psychologists, uh, led by Catherine Phillips at Northwestern University in the United States. And what Catherine Phillips did was, was very simple. She got together small groups of people and she asked them to solve a kind of problem. It was like a, like a murder mystery problem. Like who committed the crime? Here's the evidence, here's the witness statements, here's three possible suspects. Uh, who, who did the crime? And if you, give, um, if you give one person this dossier of information and 20 minutes, the chance that they get the correct answer is not great, it's less than 50%. And remember, this is a multiple choice question with three answers. So um, three answers, multiple choice, 50-50 chance, it's not good, yeah? Even a chimpanzee can get uh, 33%. If instead you give it to a group of friends, um, then their chance of finding the correct answer improves, but it goes from just below 50% to just above 50%. So that's not great. You have four times the brain power, four times the, the effort available, and yet you've only slightly increased your chance of, of finding the correct answer. But Catherine Phillips did something very interesting. So they ran an experiment with half the people in the experiment were in groups of four with their friends. And half the people in the experiment were in groups of four, three friends, one stranger. Just for maximum awkwardness, you had these three, you, these three friends, you're trying to kind of talk to each other, there's this other person who doesn't know the group, but you still have the dossier of, inf of information and you have 20 minutes and you have to try to figure out the answer. So um, you would think, I think before you'd heard anything I've said, you would think this is not going to help. But because I've been telling you about the power of disruption and obstacles, now you're thinking, ah, yeah, having the stranger in the room makes things better, uh, and, it, and it does, it does. What is surprising? Well, there are two things that surprise me. The first is that the, the improvement in performance is huge. So from just above 50% to 75%. So the, just to be clear, the gap between the groups of friends and the group with the stranger is as big as the gap between the groups of friends and the chimpanzee who is choosing at random. It's a huge performance improvement. 
by adding this stranger who has no extra information, no extra skill. All they're adding is awkwardness. All they're adding is difficulty. Like now we have to deal with a stranger in our conversation. But the other thing that is really surprising is that when Catherine Phillips asked people how they thought they, this had gone, the people who were trying to solve the problem with their friends thought they'd done really well. They had a nice time and they thought they'd had a good conversation and they thought they got the right answer, but which often they hadn't. But the group with the stranger, they didn't have a good time, they didn't think they had a good conversation, and they didn't think they had the right answer, even though they usually did. So this is really important. Because what I'm describing here is a situation where the obstacle arrives, there's a problem, the stranger, it's awkward, now the conversation is more difficult. And it helps people solve the problem better because of the obstacle. But they don't realise it. And if you gave them the choice, they would throw this solution away and go back to the old way. We very often don't realise how advantageous the disruption can be. We would, we would rather be like Keith Jarrett, just walking away from the piano, instead of saying, I'm going to embrace it. Remember, he only did it because he felt sorry for Vera Brandis. He didn't think, oh, a bad piano, what a great opportunity to be more creative. Of course he didn't think that. Who would think that? He thought, a bad piano, I don't want to play. But because he was forced to play, he discovered, to his surprise, that there was a creative response waiting for him. And I've been thinking about how this all plays out with the pandemic. I mean, some of, some of the creative responses are obvious. The fact that I, here in the UK, can talk to you uh, on the other side of the world in a, a, a Uruguayan summer is a, a creative response to a really, really hard situation. And we'll see others, and I think some of them will be more surprising. Uh, I've been working on um, a BBC programme about the search for a vaccine. And one thing that surprised me, I asked a, a specialist in these new mRNA vaccines. I, I said, oh, well, will there be scientific advances on the back of these, these vaccines? Uh, what, what else can we do? And I expected her to say, oh yeah, we'll be able to vaccinate against other pandemics um, faster in future. She didn't say that. She said, oh, we're hoping that we will be able to vaccinate people against their own cancer. So you get cancer and we take a, a sample of your tumour and then we can create a vaccine just for you and then we can vaccinate you so you fight your own cancer off. This is not the creative response. I was expecting. You know, we never know where these difficult situations are going to take us. I know now that uh, South America is facing a lot of problems because of the pandemic. Europe, I don't need to tell you, is facing a lot of problems with the pandemic. And the problems are real. People are dying. Uh, people are really suffering economically. I don't want to pretend that the problems uh, are really just opportunities and everything is great. But there are also opportunities. And the lesson for me of Keith Jarrett, the lesson of that research with Catherine Phillips, the, the psychologist, the lesson of the London Underground industrial action, is that often, even when the opportunity is there, we, we try to walk away. We don't realise it. It's very hard to open your eyes and to see it. I said I would come back to uh, Brian Eno. So when I interviewed Brian Eno, he gave me this. It's a little black box, the oblique strategies. And inside the box are little cards. And they say simple, crazy things. This one says, change instrument roles. What's going on? What, what, what's this all about? Well, when Eno was working with David Bowie in uh, Berlin, in the 1970s on these very famous uh, albums, Lodger and Low and Heroes, great albums. He would arrive at the studio with this box, with these cards, 
Uh, and when people were getting stuck, he would pull out a card and it would provide them with a challenge. So, for example, change instrument roles. So you've got the best drummer in the world and you've got the best guitarist in the world, but the guitarist is playing the drums and the drummer is playing the guitar. It's, it's crazy. I mean, why would you do that? And the musicians hated this. They absolutely hated these experiments. They said they told them the music sounded terrible, the experiments were stupid, it was embarrassing. Carlos Alomar, the great guitarist, said the cards were like being slapped in the face. But uh, you know that crazy experiment with the guitarist on the drums? Carlos Alomar, amazing guitarist, was playing the drums on Heroes. I mean, this amazing single which made space for another guitarist, Fripp, to come in and play that soaring solo at the beginning. They, they created this music while they were doing these stupid experiments. And Carlos Alomar said, yeah, it's like being slapped in the face. And then he said, if your foot is hurting and you're slapped in the face, it, now you're not thinking about your foot. You're thinking about something else. You're thinking a different way. And while those cards were crazy, he now says he uses the cards with his music students. He says, I need them to feel the way I felt. He's figured out 30 years later that just because you hate it doesn't mean it isn't helping you. And that's why I find the cards fascinating. Because not only are they an obstacle, not only do they disrupt us, but they're also something that we don't like. And the, the randomization, the drawing of the card is what forces you to deal with it. Originally, the cards were just a list. Brian Eno would just have this list on the wall and he would pick something from the list. And then he realized that doesn't work. You can't have a list. It has to be a random drawing of a card because then you can't escape. So I have this box of cards and I very, very rarely open them. And I don't open them very often because they scare me. Because it is frightening to be given the challenge, to be told, stop doing what you're doing and do it this different way. But sometimes I do open the box and I very often find that the challenge is helpful. And more generally, I don't need to tell you to challenge yourself more, not today, no, no, not in 2021. I don't need to tell you to look for disruption. The disruptions are here, the challenges are here. But maybe I do need to encourage you to look for the seed of creativity in those challenges. I asked Brian Eno how, uh, how often he uses the cards. He says, oh, I would, I would only ever use the cards if I was stuck. And I said, how often are you stuck? He said, all the time. We need to find a way to face the disruption and the challenges head on and in them to find the seeds of a more creative response. It's not easy. Uh, maybe it requires taking a a random pick from a crazy deck of cards. Or maybe it's getting the awkward stranger involved in your group. Or maybe it's just a guilt trip from a German teenager. But whatever it is, all of us from time to time need to sit down and play the unplayable piano. Thanks very much for listening. It's been great having a chance to share my ideas.